everyone. Super excited to be here. Let me uh, introduce myself. So I hope you can see my screen okay. Um, my name is Kat. I am a CMO, advisor, and angel investor. My experience includes being a CMO at different startups at different stages, but with, they have achieved a cumulative valuation of over $1 billion. I've been a co-founder twice, including one exit. I've scaled teams and done so in three continents, um, LATAM, Asia, and uh, UK. Um, and I'm also an angel investor. I am quite agnostic, but I've um, recently gone and specialized more on AI and B2B um, SaaS and have some investments in healthcare. And I'm also a limited partner at a fund called Marketing One. And I am also an advisor and mentor for startups. I love sharing my experience and I am particularly um, passionate about these below organizations. C Ventures is a VC fund that invests um, only in women. Amazon Frontlines protects the Amazon forest in Ecuador from oil exploration and then the World Bank distributes money to um, those in need. So I'm an advisor at all those <clears throat> organizations. So what did I want to talk about? Um, setting KPIs, in particular, why goals matter, when the right time to start is, how to set goals that make sense, how to break them down, getting buy-in and accountability. And then I wanted to talk you through a real world example that I had working at a um, one of those companies um, in my career. So, um, Chris, can you help me out with a quick poll? Wow. So, yep. Are you gonna Are you gonna read it? Yep. Uh, so we're gonna ask you how you would rate your company or team's goal setting process on a scale of four to excellent. Uh, so we're just trying to get a sense of you know where you feel like your goal setting is, and uh, so that Kat can kind of tailor. Um, her recommendations throughout the talk towards that. Looks like so far, 70% of people feel like it's adequate. 25% feel like it's four and only 3% so far think it's excellent. Well, so hopefully if we did this again at a future point in time, we get better results from the um, uh, af after this talk. So I'll, I'll hopefully help you with some ideas and, and clarify some of the questions. Cool. I'll go ahead and end the poll. Cool. Thank you. How do I get rid of press share results? There we go. I don't know. How do I get rid of that on my screen? Uh, there should be just an X button in the top left. Oh my God. There we go. There we go. So sorry about that. Um, so why do goals matter? should be quite obvious. They matter because they give clarity and direction for the for the business. They show you where the where to focus and what the direction of travel is. And they also help you measure progress and pace uh, to me and it helps you measure the quality and the pace of work. And especially the beginning of um, um, a company or when you're going through this process for the first time, you might set goals. You don't exactly know whether you're going to be able to hit. But even having a North Star like that is going to enable you to to see how much work you can get through and, and how closely that matches up to um, to where your goal is. And then for t individual teams, that helps team cohesion and priority setting. So everybody pulls in the same direction. You can prioritize, you can know what to focus on first. And then of course, um, the, the feeling of achievement and satisfaction when you do hit your targets and, and that joint um, celebration and, and progress for the company. So when's the right time to start setting goals? And, and I've often um, pondered about this and been asked this, you know, what do you do when you're just a team of um, very few people, a group of uh, um, young entrepreneurs that might set up as a, um, you know, as a founding team versus a, a company that is, you know, maybe pre-seed, seed stage or, or beyond? So the answer is now is always the right time to start. And the reason is because you need to know where you're going. You have to have a direction of travel even if the team and the company is very small and even if it's just you, you, you have to know what you're going for and what you're hoping to achieve over a period of time. What does change is the time that's dedicated to planning and, and executing. So I've been part of companies where that planning process can take two to three months and sometimes isn't completed until the end of the first quarter. 
And when it's just you or a very small team, you can do that just in a in a morning and and reflect on it and 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 revise. So it's a it depends on the size of the company, but you should always have a north star so you can achieve what you need to. So how do we go about setting goals that make sense? Because it's very easy to have a goal, but not all of them make sense. And and it's a really delicate balance, and it depends from organization to um, to organization and, and the level of complexity also varies. But what I've usually focused on is starting at the end and working backwards. So thinking about what do I want to achieve in, let's say, by the end of this year or in the next three years and aligning that as closely to my vision as possible, having a mix of qualitative and quantitative goals, and I'll go into what that means, and then making it practical. So let's start at the end. So if you have no goals in place and you're starting this process, here's some questions that you might ask yourselves. What do we want to achieve in the future? Say in three or five years, how far out you feel it's sensible to, to think about? Really be clear on what success might look like and be specific about that. So are we getting to a, an annual revenue uh, um, rate of 5 million by 2027? Are we going to have 150 B2B customers? Are we raising a financing round at a particular valuation. So, so you need to be really um, specific about the outcome you're trying to, to look at. And then you think about the actions needed to achieve that desired outcome. And then you think about what are the milestones needed? And then you think about what are the resources, capabilities or partnerships that might get you there. And then you think about how to measure progress towards that future goal. And then the North Star in that list is the one thing under which this this whole system ladders up. So if you know that you're going to get a, uh, that you're focused on raising a, um, you need to have a financing round, then um, done, then perhaps your North Star is making sure that your product is ready at a particular um, quality level because nobody's going to buy your product unless it's hit that quality standard. And then when you fit that quality standard, you can get customers. And when you can get customers, you can get that financing round. So, so that is how to think about the um, the North Star, figuring out the one thing under which um, the, the the other goals uh, um, sit, and, and they all help towards that. So let's work backwards. So you don't have any goals in place. You've asked yourself these questions about what the future look like, looks like and what are you trying to achieve. So here are some example goals and some key actions you might do. So in 2027, your goal is to have a revenue run rate of 5 million, 150 B2B clients, and a net promoter score of 85. And in order to do that, you have to expand to the yes to bring your customer acquisition costs down and bring your lifetime value up. And you're going to have a product-led growth sales motion So, um, in order to make it more scalable. Therefore, by 2025, you need to have revenue run rate of 1.5 million, 80 B2B clients and a net promoter score of 70. In order to do that, you have to release a new product and hire a sales team, which means today, by the end of the year, you have to deliver um, a revenue run rate of half a million, get 20 B2B clients and have a quality score NPS of 60, which means you need to launch your product in the UK, expand the engineering team and tell people that you exist through a PR drive. And that is how the um, you're able to ladder up what you're trying to do and, and um, build it out over, over time by starting backwards. Now, let's look at qualitative and quantitative goals. What I typically like to do is, is not make some project based and make some numeric based. And, and the reason behind that is that you don't necessarily have control of all the numbers, but you have much be bigger, better control over um, project-based work. So when you're trying to remunerate people based on their effort, um, the that's where the qualitative element comes in. So there, there might be projects like implement a new HR system by a specific time or um, work towards completing the expansion um, of the product to the yes during um, the second quarter. You then have a set of... Um, quantitative goals, which is for ongoing work, which is going to help you achieve your, your targets, such as um, 
revenue, sales qualified leads, customer acquisition costs, lifetime value, et cetera. But like this, you have a nice balance of projects and, and essentially uh, uh, tactical executions and pulling levers in order to get to your goals. The last thing on that list when you think about setting goals is to make it practical. So they have to be specific. They have to be time bound. So by a specific uh, point in time, you have to achieve X in revenue or percentage uh, uh, gross margin or whatever it may be. They have to be measurable. So you have to have a very clear and defined way of measuring uh, that particular KPI because if you can't measure it, you don't know what you're going after. I would recommend sharing um, the goals across teams and everybody contributes with a different aspect towards it. And I'll show some examples of how that works. And you have to make them hard, um, but not any harder than is necessary. So when you think about setting them, we obviously want to get to 100%, but we want to set them so realistically that we feel 90% achievement is possible. So we want to have people a little bit outside their comfort zone and feel a little bit uncomfortable about them, but still within the realms of the doable. Because if they're so far apart from what is realistic, people are just going to stop trying and, and you won't motivate your team. Now, how do you break your goals down? So here is a example from a B2B company. So we've identified through our looking backwards exercise that we need to get to a particular revenue number. The revenue number is the key KPI. That's what we're tracking, the 0 0.5 million, for example, um, in revenue. Now, how are we going to get to revenue? What is the formula of driving that revenue? The formula for driving that revenue is the, a number of leads times a conversion rate times an average purchase value times the percentage of repeat rate of that particular customer. These are the contributing KPIs, and these are the different levers that you're able to pull throughout a time period in order to drive revenue. So if you're realizing that getting leads is very expensive um, on the different platforms, you might want to focus on conversion rate optimization, or you might want to increase your prices or uh, work on um, reducing your, your cost, or you, you're going to start implementing a CRM system to encourage people to come back and, and purchase from your website. So every single key KPI normally is, is, is composed of contributing KPIs that sit below it. And this essentially then becomes your growth formula, if you will. So we've now we've set our KPIs. We know they're sensible. We've worked backwards. We've broken them down. Now we want to make sure that people are excited by them. They believe them and they are able to execute and we're going to hold them accountable. How do we do that? So first of all, we've got to get the buy-in. So we're going to be defining the goals as a team. Typically that happens in the C-suite or by leadership, who between them discuss about what is going to move the company forward. And typically that, that conversation happens, numbers and, and targets are, are decided, um, and then they're reviewed against the bottom up from the, the next le layer of management down to sense check whether it's, it's possible, whether it's ambitious enough, and also to make sure that, that everybody's had a say and has been heard in that process. And then the final decision typically then is a top-down decision by management who say, okay, we set the direction, we heard the bottom up from the teams, and now we've come to a conclusion to say, these are the numbers and the targets that we're gonna set down, uh, set in stone. And what that allows to do, it's, it's perhaps a lengthier process and, and it's more relevant for larger teams and larger organizations. But what it means is that everybody gets a say and a feeling of control. And when you have that feeling of control, you have buy-in um, in, into what we're trying to achieve. And then 
So people believe and they're, they're bought into what we're trying to do. How do you make them accountable? So the goals have to be communicated clearly, the what they are, what they mean, how we measure them. We need to share progress often, typically monthly, at a very high level to see in a red, amber, green or percentage achievement uh, is quite a nice way of doing that. And then the responsible um, people in a, in a, and, and, and um, employees in a team, they update their progress <clears throat> as it relates to those goals and say, here I'm off, um, I'm struggling with this, here are some blockers. So essentially the entire work that's get, that gets done is totally focused um, on achieving these KPIs. And What's important when we measure is to use really simple systems. So it might be as simple as an Excel sheet or a table on a PowerPoint, just to say on revenue, are we red, amber, green? What are the different departments and teams doing? And what are the specific projects in order to take that number up at the right rate? Now, we've gone through this exercise and, and we've set some great KPIs and they don't work. So we are completely off. Uh, the the teams are getting demotivated. We feel we, we can't quite, um, you know, we, we feel that the, the process isn't isn't right. What happens? And when 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 that sentiment starts coming up. So when you face this situation, you have to have a conversation and address it. Why are we so far apart from the KPIs? Why do we think this is happening? What is happening on this particular um, indicator that we are in this particular goal that we're we're tracking? Why are we why are we off track here? Ask yourselves: Are the targets too hard? Um, are we able, perhaps, not to measure it appropriately? And really dig into the blockers and how you might remove them, and try and get proof points of the corrective action you've identified. Whether that is actually able to remedy the problem quickly enough. What you might want to do in, in those conversations is either um, refine the the um, the goals into something more specific, rather than, for example, saying um, revenue. Maybe you just focus on leads, lead generation on its own, um, rather than setting goals for an entire year. Maybe you just want to go and focus on a quarter because things are so volatile in the business. And I particularly went through that. We I worked in a in a clinic during um, clinic chain during COVID. And we just didn't know what was going to happen. At one moment, revenue was going through the floor because nobody was leaving their house. And then we bought a PCR machine and suddenly we had um, huge amounts of revenue and we had to adjust the company. We couldn't plan. We could hardly plan a month ahead. You know, So we just went really, really um, short time bound so we could stay super agile. And then the, and that's what I essentially mean also by chunking down. So taking a a um, a KPI and and re and um, reducing it into its its sort of component parts to um, and and focus um, focus on that and making things perhaps a bit easier that way. Now I want to talk you through a real world example. So this is um, from uh, it's a while ago, from about ten years ago, from a company that I was CMO at, the company is called Dr. Consulta. It's a um, low cost primary healthcare chain uh, that is um, out of Sao Paulo in Brazil. I joined them as chief marketing officer. When I joined them, we had four clinics and it now stands at about 50 plus. Um, and we went through a very, very quick revenue expansion from four to 30 clinics in 18 months. So within a year, we went from 10 to 30. So it's sort of trebling of size, trebling of revenue um, and, and, and team. And so here's a framework that we use to make sure that everybody knew what they were doing and everybody's action from the doorman um, in, uh, at the clinic right through the CEO was laddering up to the things that mattered the most to that company. So what you can see here, if you look up here, first of all, so we have here company goals, which was revenue of 15 million, EBITDA of 0.3 million, so our efficiency before earnings before tax, cash flow, so how much money we had um, in the bank, and then a net promoter score. Those were deemed by the CEO 
to be the most important goals for the company that would bring the company forward and to a new um, new level ready for fundraising for a Series B round. We split them, excuse me, into quantitative and qualitative goals. And here you have the different heads, CFO, Chief Operating Officer, CMO, Chief Product, Chief Medical Officer, and Chief Technology Officer. And the CFO, CPO, and CTO, are, they, they all had goals. <laughs> Just for simplicity, I wanted to share here how these these um, these goals up here were shared between me and then the chief operating officer and the chief medical officer. So my goal was 15 million of revenue. And that was because I owned the marketing funnel. The chief operating officer, she had an impact on revenue and she had to drive 1 million in clinic sales, meaning that um, upselling extra product for patients that were already in the clinic. So when somebody comes in to do a blood test, you say if they wanted to have um, sell them a dentistry treatment, for example. So that was her way and her method for being able to contribute to revenue. I had to drive 660,000 patient visits, which had a direct impact to revenue. I had to drive an ROI of 10, which had a di direct impact on the earnings before um, tax and the cash flow, because the better my ROI, the less money I spent and the higher my earnings. She had an influence over um, EBITDA and um, also net promoter score by being really efficient on the clinic. We had a very stringent rule around patient turnaround time. Patients had to come into the clinic and leave the clinic within 60 minutes. And that was the most efficient um, uh, metric to make sure we, we got enough volume of people through the clinics. And then her qualitative goal was bringing five clinics to break even. So we expanded rapidly and it takes a while to get to break even. So five of these 20 clinics that we opened had to be at break even. And I also shared that. Um, and then with the chief medical officer, for example, um, his way to impact revenue was to have a hundred dollars um, gross revenue per hour per doctor. So each doctor had to make $100 of gross revenue. It doesn't sound like a lot, but in Brazil, that's quite a lot of money. Um, and then the, the center capex, so the capital expenditure per clinic had to be less than $200,000. So we're expanding fast and building clinics. They had to be built for less than $200,000. And the, the chief medical officer had a significant say in that. So that is how he contributed to EBITDA and cash flow. And he also had to work on breaking, putting the clinics at break even because he could hire better doctors. Um, who we, he could deliver a better patient experience and he's looking after the capex and that it was his way of influencing that. So in that same way, you can imagine these KPIs are shared between the CFO, the chief product and the CTO. So everybody has a particular way to contribute to the company goals. Now, you can see here, this was from the CEO to his management team. And now we go into the team level. So this is the CMO, this is me uh, with my team lead. So I had a digital head, an offline media person who did work around the clinic, a call center um, lead who, who led essentially um, all the incoming calls, somebody who did BI and analytics, a comms lead and somebody who did retention. And again, we here, so here, are my, um, these are actually my individual goals. So revenue of 15 million, an ROI of more than 10, 660,000 patients and the break even of the clinics. And um, so the, the digital, the quantitative goal is that um, we, we split the 15 million into three, digital, offline and call center. They were all um, had an influence over driving revenue and they all got, turned out they had 30% 30, 30 in each channel. Therefore, they all got a third of the revenue target. And then depending on the efficiency of each chance, they had a, um, the digital and the offline person had a um, different ROI target, which again, uh, impacted cash flow and a bit there. The call center person, uh, a lead had a, because she took calls and, and, and helped solve patients' problems, she had a significant influence over net promoter score. And then she also had an ability to reduce no-shows by calling people. And that is how she was able to reduce, um, uh, able to produce revenue. And then they had specific projects like an ad attribution model that was rolled out. The offline had to drive more revenue, therefore breaking clinics, uh, doing the break even at the clinics. And then the call center had a Zendesk project implemented. And the same for comms. 
the comms lead, um, her role in, in driving revenue was to have t increased target group awareness to 30% from 3%. So it was a massive increase, which was going to lead to customer acquisition and therefore more patients in the clinic. And that way you can see how the whole system from the CEO now down to me is adding up. And that was repeated from CEO to CMO and all the other leadership, CTO, chief operating officer, et cetera. They all follow this exact same model to the next layer down. And then we measured it. So here you can see, um, this is these are actual the actual formats. So we had the digital lead had um, the, the numbers in blue are the key KPIs and the um, the text in yellow uh, and text in, excuse me, uh, white are the contributing KPIs. And so we're looking at the levers that are helping us to get to the key KPIs. They all had a different kind of weighting. And the digital leaders looking at revenue, number of patient visits, ROI, attribution model, and so on. And then for each month, we had a, a target, an actual, and a difference to the target. And we rolled that out for each month, January to December. We had a baseline a start in January and we thought, okay, we how much can we improve ROI per month? That means how much can we improve our customer acquisition cost um, per month? That means um, how much can we take up our um, customer lifetime value per month? And we made an estimate on that and, and then measured it every single month to see um, how the contributing KPIs were impacting the, the key KPIs. And that was repeated for each of the each of the heads from the digital to the offline and the list goes on. And then we had these monthly reviews on progress and corrective action. And quite amazingly, we got 95 achievement, percent achievement across the different KPIs that I mentioned before, revenue, patient visits, clinic break even. And so we were very, very close at, at setting the targets and, and um, rode a good wave in, in terms of delivering for the company. Overall, we went from 15 million to 75 million in revenue. And then end of the year achievement. So HR was also closely involved. So every person in the company was evaluated against KPIs for their performance review. So here you can see mine, the number of visits, revenue, ROI, breaking even the clinics and uh, um, net promoter score. That was the target, a target description and how it would be calculated and where the data would be taken from. Um, <clears throat> what a minimum achievement looks like, a 90% and 100% achievement, what the weighting of the KPI is, and then the calculation of the total. So essentially, there's no doubt about what you have to achieve, what the minimum achievement is, and every single person in the company had this formula um, in order to motivate them and, and by the end of the year then reward them with a bonus. And that is the end of the presentation. So um, I'm curious to open the floor to questions. Yeah, there's a there's a couple. I'm an MCAT. Um, thanks. Uh, for on the, okay, can you just? Yeah, I'll read them out. Yeah, um, can you read them out? For sure. So the most upvoted one is: What would be the indicators that you set the wrong goals, um, either in magnitude or focus altogether? How do you revise them and communicate that? I would say if you are on two or more, if you're if you're further off than than thirty percent, you have to have a conversation because that is quite a um, an indication that you're either uh, yeah, things aren't going the right way for for whatever reason. So so, and if it's more than thirty percent, then it's even even more alarming, but that's when I would um, start looking at that. And I, I would measure and look at the, the numbers monthly. So, so you will see that you're, you're not hitting it relatively quickly, right? And if, if you're 30% off in the first month, you have to see how much quicker does it get better? Is it actually improving or, or have you plateaued? What was the second part of the question? And how would you communicate it? I probably wouldn't do anything about it in the first month. I would flag the fact that there's a problem, put some corrective actions in place and see how things would pan out over the next two to three weeks. And then if things didn't significantly improve, I would have a discussion about whether it makes sense to reset that uh, that KPI. 
unless we know that something material is going to change, like a new feature release or a new partnership, or unless we know something's coming down the pipe, then you're pretty much, um, you know, stuck with what you have. Awesome. Um, the next question is from uh, Andrew. Andrew, if you're still here and want to come off mute and ask your question, you're you're more than welcome to. Oh. Um, sure. Uh, so really, so it, it's actually really cool how you can uh, split out all, the, all of the departments. I think the question that I have is, um, what have you seen working well to handle the dependency across departments, right? So in the example of the COO and the CMO, uh, it, it's interdependent in a sense that uh, the more the CMO sells, the easier the upsell and vice versa, right? Like, so how do you kind of split it up? Um, at the end of the day, it's a joint agreement between the two, and it's probably never really quite fair because one um, one C, one role, one C level might have more influence than the other, and I think it just needs to be acknowledged. So there's no no specific answer on on. on um, on how that works. If you have a mechanism, if, if you can calculate it and 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 build a you know back of the back of the napkin model um, for how um, how the two of you can can get to the 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 total number, then that makes sense. So meaning that um, for example, I don't know if I implement um, um, an upsell model in the clinics by X date and. 20% of patients take it up, then I'm going to be able to deliver the 1 million revenue. Okay, great. And therefore, the um, marketing team needs to drive this much extra footfall to the clinics. And you could calibrate it like that if that's <coughs> if that's possible. Otherwise, I would say it's probably a discussion and, and an agreement between what you think you're specific, what you're specifically able to do and how you can help each other. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, I think that's exactly what we were doing. We we kind of calibrate it back and forth because usually after you review it month by month, you see some people because it's a collective goal, right? So some exactly. sometimes some people miss, some people over and under. So we're we just keep recalibrating this. Um, I was just wondering if you've seen other examples across uh, different industries, but well, if, yeah, if, if something's falling behind. So for example, we we realized in the clinic example, so the um, the upsell wasn't working so well so then we what we did is we changed the flow in the clinic in one clinic so you had to go past the sales desk as you were leaving it's quite aggressive <laughs> but it worked it's like kind of like the duty free thing you know when you when you're leaving your plane and they make you buy more chocolates um we essentially did that and and that worked and then we rolled it rolled it out to 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 um to more clinics and another thing that we did for example as we realized sort of you know, at the beginning that it was just too hard in terms of what the numbers were and what we what we could do. Marketing then gave um, uh, the the CEO a part of their budget to give it to the clinic leads um, and the clinic manager. And the clinic manager had per month a thousand um, equivalent of a thousand dollars to spend on marketing as they wanted. They could buy people coffees or get a masseuse in and do a little mini marketing campaign around it. So, so we started implementing things like, um, like that. Awesome. Cool. Uh, next question is from uh, Anonymous. Um, in one of the slides, there is a sentence uh, like, even with a small team, we should have a goal. The difference is the time for planning. Uh, why is there a difference in the time for planning? Can you tell us more about this? Sure. Um, basically because small organizations are fast and large organizations are slow. So you could sit, if you're a small team, um, let's say five or 10 people, probably everybody um, or most people in that team are involved in the goal setting and, and, and you run through a workshop um, uh, to, to set the targets, maybe look at some numbers and have a, a very quick iteration. And, and I could say probably within a, a week, you can have a set of agreed targets. If you have a company with 100 people or I used to work at Microsoft. We had, you know, thousands of people. Um, the 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 planning process was so complicated because you have so much data input from different organizations that has to be prepared, it has to be analyzed, 
It has to then come to the strategy department, who then make the recommendations to the different departments' heads, who then have to give their feedback to then come to a decision. And that takes months. It's just the volume of information that has to get digested and the amount of people that have to be consulted. And you don't have that in small teams. Awesome. Uh, the next question is from Sharon. Uh, Sharon, if you're still here, you're welcome to uh, read your question out loud. If not, I'm happy to do it. Sure. Um, so my question is, uh, in terms of across the C-suite, you had mentioned the the CMO, the um, the chief medical officer, and I can't recall, the COO. And then mm -hmm. for the other goals, for CPO, CTO, and CFO, where it might not necessarily be directly um, attributed to or uh, related to the revenue ROI and uh, um, is it Epida? Um, Epida? The, uh, just curious how they approach their goals and if there is uh, like kind of the cross-functional aspect of, you know, what does the product, um, how can product deliver to kind of those revenue goals indirectly? Um, but just wondering if you're able to share a little more about kind of those other other roles and how they yeah. think about goals. No, it's a great question. So, um, the there were there were differences, and for example, we had the most um, I, I'd say the most different uh, goals. The CTO was was uh, the least connected to the overall. Uh, he had goals like system uptime and rollout of um, new backend booking system. But the backend booking system, if you will, if it's better, then we can have um, more patients booked. Um, more quickly. So that was his way to sort of relate to revenue, but he had, that was his only sort of revenue relating uh, project. The rest was to do with security um, and conforming to certain ISO standards. And, 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 and so he had more on the sort of qualitative uh, project side. On product, we had rollout of new features and um, new products. So, um, which were, the, um, which had to be done to time um, so they were really uh, um, very, very focused on on efficiency and building towards time um, in order to save resources. And that was measured or the impact on that was on essentially cash flow because you have more output um, for less people cost. Um, and then the product could drive more um, more revenue. So one, one of the things we went to automatic booking on the website didn't exist before. We were the first people in Brazil to roll that out because before you went on the website and then call the phone number. I mean, this is <laughs> 2015. Um, so it wouldn't exist today, but, but at that time it did. And, and so we, when we rolled out the automatic booking, it took, it took down costs in other part of the business. And that was how we, um, you know, positively, how product had a positive impact on, um, on ROI and also on net promoter score, um, we could now roll that out and measure it through the um, um, uh, through uh, um, you know the website it improved the customer um, acquisition process and and so we asked questions of like you know how easy was it for you to book and 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 um, and things like that so that's what they were able to how they were able to 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 support the larger metrics so I'd say the most separate was the chief technology and and we were able to align most for the chief product officer. Um, yeah. Can't remember if I got someone. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, the next question is from, uh, we have probably time for two more questions. Um, the next question is from Alexander. Uh, Alexander, are you still here? If not, I can read it out. Um, yeah, hello. hello. I think that's me. Um, yeah, Oh, let me switch on the camera. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, so, yeah, my question is... Um, uh, oh. oh, we lost your audio, Alexander. Can't hear you. It doesn't look like you're on mute either. I'll read it out. Um, how do these goals cascade down to the lowest IC level? The tricky part I find, especially in engineering, is that you can reasonably well cascade the goals to departments and teams, but tracking individual contribution can be tricky since most of the time it's a team's it's a team work. Yeah, it's it's true. I mean, but because if, especially if you have a very large engineering organization with say sort of um three three levels of you know from 
senior engineer to engineer to, to junior, it gets harder. You might then want to consider more project, um, higher weighting towards specific projects that you hope impact um, revenue, uh, I don't know, whatever the specific um the specific um, goal for the organization is. I think at the at the top level, at the senior level, it should be relatively um, it should be relatively clear. And then the people below that, they essentially have to deliver on time and quality. Uh, and it's probably more project based. Awesome. Thank you. And for the last question, we have Amy's. Um, Amy, are you, are you still here and want to close us out? With the last question. Yeah, fantastic. I'm uh, feeling honored that it made the cut. Um, <laughs> so, so my question is around, um, this is something that I'm facing right now. So my company, uh, we've just started building out the go-to-market function. And um, I want to set goals around things like lead conversion, around um, driving more qualified leads. But what I'm finding is that we don't have any of the systems in place right now to be able to track accurately. Mm -hmm how we measure against those. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not sure exactly what to do. I, I don't want to put all of that work on hold. I think that my gut sense is that there are still things we can do that are directionally correct, even if we're not able to measure them. But also I think the other pull is to um, maybe have a goal instead that's around implementing the systems that we need to be able to track those. So I'm curious, what you think there. And, and and ultimately we do have limited time and resources. So if, even if we had those two goals, how do we split our effort and attention like from on a scale of one to 10, right? Is it like 30% on let's try to do what we're going to do, but 70% on implementing the things we need to do to be able to track? It sounds like the ability to track is, well, probably doing the thing that you need to do is more important than the ability to track actually. Um, mm. thinking about it. Um, because if not, then you're not doing anything, right? And you're not getting any information. Um, yeah. um, but the 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 system is an important component. So that could be like your qualitative or your, your project metric, right? By implement the system to a particular date on a particular budget um, in order to let you track. What you could track is, is, is like break down that go-to-market process into um, simpler steps and estimate sort of time effort. So you can measure your your efficiency, even if you, and and you could think about um, ways to measure um, impact. If you're um, um, so efficiency through time, you know time and resources, and and I don't know if you have a a a um, you know um, some simple tools you might be able to to implement on um, to to measure leads through I don't know through LinkedIn or through other platforms, HubSpot or some of these platforms that that you might have. Um, don't have don't have. The yeah. <laughs> um, what you might do is um, it's a, it's a you you could at least set a baseline um, today um, and and by asking people in the teams like how how much do you think doing this is going to get us um, and take an average from that at least you have a baseline and then when your system is implemented you can get to the to the actuals and in the meantime you measure pace and effort required in order to do it. Okay. So, so it's to my mind. <laughs> would you advocate for spending some time though on implementing some of those systems so that we can have better maturity against tracking? Yes. Yes. Because, because you might be wasting a lot of money, right? Without knowing it. Yeah. And you might be going in completely the wrong direction without having any feedback um, so yes, if, if there's quick wins, um, and it's not like a six month process, I would definitely spend a month or, you know, a few weeks to, to do something like that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. It's a really great question, actually. Thanks, Amy. Um, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for your time today. Uh, we've reached the end of our time with Kat. Um, for further reading on goal setting, I dropped a blog post and Kat has a couple of artifacts with us on this same thing. Uh, Kat, before we end the meeting, any, uh, any final words of wisdom for, for the group here? Um, just good luck. <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, going through the work, even if it's not perfect, it's an iterative process. You're going to learn just by thinking about it and dedicating the time to doing it, how, how, good you are at it, how the organization receives it. I've been working in an organization that isn't 
used to doing this at all. And and just having thought about what the numbers might be was already a massive win. And it's different from organization to organization. But I think making people think about where they need to focus their energy is always worth the time, even if it's not perfect yet, like in Amy's case. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll see you at our next event. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for attending. Bye. Thank you.